to those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and, and were the badge of food stay, we appreciate you. To those who've experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or children who've run away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make things harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who have lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who have lived through driving tests, medical appointments, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. For those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those of you who delight in the joy of grandchildren, we join you. And to those of you who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we both grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart. And we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. We remember you. We remember you. We remember you. I think that video so beautifully draws out the tension of this day. It's a joy-filled celebration for some, and it's an emotional slog to get through for others. And regardless of what side you sort of fall on, uh, we just want you to know that you are seen, valued, and loved. In some ways, I, I personally am caught in between the tug of both of those, celebrating my wife and the way that she is just an amazing mom to our kids and grieving still the loss of my mom. And Mother's Day can be a challenging day for preachers. I just need you to know that going in. So I thought what I'd do today is give you all of my best advice on mothering. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. <laughs> it is a bold move for a man to stand up and give advice to moms. Let's just name that for what it is. The second reason it's challenging is because M Mother's Day is a Hallmark holiday. It's not a church calendar holiday. Right? And that's not to say that the scriptures don't teach anything about mothering. They do, absolutely. Uh, but this is a fairly new holiday in regards to sort of the scope of history. We can't find what St. Augustine said about Mother's Day or uh, Charles or John Wesley said about Mother's Day, although all of their moms had significant roles in their spiritual journey and their faith development. Uh, but I just need you to know at the onset that our approach here to manual faith is that this is not a day that's about Mother's Day. This is a day that's about Jesus. Because we never give our time in this worship service to, to lesser things. So today, we're going to teach out of the scriptures. It's going to apply to mothers, but it's also going to apply to every single disciple of Jesus. And those who are sort of looking in, wondering, do I want to start following the way of Jesus? Or even to those who have been dragged here by their mom because that's all they wanted for Mother's Day. <laughs> if that's you, I'm glad you're here. 
to those who are joining us online and in the chapel, we are glad that you are here as well. Will you open your Bible with me to Genesis chapter 16? And as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of context. There was a man by the name of Abram who was given a great promise from God. The promise was that he would be the father of many nations. The only problem was that he didn't, is that he didn't have any kids and his wife was barren. And so Abram and Sarai, they left the land that they had called home at the calling of God. They walked into the unknown, into the land of Canaan, and they waited patiently for God to be good on his promise. And they waited 10 years and saw no kids. And at that point in time, Abram and Sarai, they decided to, to take things into their own hands. How many of you know that when you take things into your own hands, it doesn't typically go all that well? Can I get an amen? <laughs> Abram and Sarai are about to find that out, and that's where we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Are you there? Yes. Wonderful. It says this. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And so embedded within this first verse, you just have to hear a decade's worth of hopes and dreams that have been crushed by the reality of life. As scholar Gerhard von Rad wrote, there is no greater sorrow for an Israelite woman than childlessness. Verse 2. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, that is, sleep with my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now, this <laughs> sounds strange to us. Um, can I get an amen? It does. It is. And yet, there's, there's cultural nuance and cultural things going on in this passage that would have said, if a wealthy woman was barren, one of the ways that she could have children was through one of her servants. And so, Sarai is sort of running the playbook of her culture and her day and her time. Verse 3. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. She, she gave Sarai that glare. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> That's when you run, brother. That's when you run. Right? May it be on you. I gave you my servant for your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, this is your problem. Sort of. Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly. Everybody say harshly harshly with her, and she fled from her. Now, there are mountains of cultural nuance and context that are going on in this passage. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but what I want you to hear and what I want you to see is that Hagar, an Egyptian slave, has gotten pregnant, now, not out of her own choice, not out of her own will, but because of the position in life that she is in, and now she is cast out into the wilderness. She's kicked out of the place that she called home. And she has to be thinking, she's in exile now on the run, wondering, does anybody care? Does anybody see? Does anybody hear? I'm carrying this child. How will I make ends meet? Some of you in this space, have had similar feelings. How is this going to work out? And it's in this space that we see God meet this soon-to-be mom at her lowest point and start to speak a, a word of hope into her pain. 
Listen to the way the story continues. It says, and the angel of the Lord found her. I love that phrase. He found her. By a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. Later we're going to find out that this, this angel is actually God himself. That becomes clear in verse 13. And don't miss the fact that God finds her. This woman who's on the run, this woman whose life is not turning out any way that she imagined it turning out when she was a little girl growing up in Egypt. Th this girl is found at her lowest point. The one who was kicked out is now being sought out. Verse 8. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. This event probably took place about 75 air miles from where Abram and Sarai called home. So you have to imagine that Hagar has been on the run for many days at this point in time. And I love that we're told that she is in the wilderness, but also she's next to a what? Spring. And the author of Genesis, Moses, wants us to catch and he wants us to hold on to that not only is this where she is at physically, but now we're going to see it as a metaphor too. She's in the wilderness, but she's about to be introduced to the spring of life. What does God do? He comes to her and he does what? He asks her a, a question. Now, here's the principle. Here's the principle. Anytime God asks a question in Scripture, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Okay? It's typically a setup, or it's a way to take somebody by the hand and to move them forward, to, to help them get unstuck, to help them start to grow start to progress, to, to move to that next level. It's the reason that as we read through the Gospels, we see Jesus asking over 300 questions throughout the Gospels. And this question is pretty beautiful. It's pretty nuanced. And, and what God knows about Hagar is that it's her honest processing that's going to free her to begin progressing. It's processing what's going on in her life that's going to allow her to move into the future. See, God is the one reaching out. According to Francis Thompson, he, he is the hound of heaven who's chasing after even Hagar. I'd like to think that Thompson chose that, that imagery. He's the hound of heaven, that title, because just like a hound closing in on a rabbit, God's reckless love is on the prowl, ready to crash in to the pain and to the darkness and to the silence that Hagar has been carrying. His light is encroaching, his presence is chasing, and he is hunting down this Egyptian slave exile outcast in the wilderness. But friends, whenever you're in the wilderness, there's a spring of life. See, because God pursues us and Hagar in our pain in order to lead us to his peace. And see here, the question is not whether or not we've been good enough, jumped high enough, or sought hard enough. The question is simply do we want to be found? Do we want to be found? And so the angel of the Lord, the Lord himself, asks Hagar a two-part question. Part number one, where have you been? Where have you been? It's as if God's saying to Hagar, tell me about your pain. Tell, tell me about your sorrow. Tell me about your heartache. Hey, Agar, tell me about the way that you go to bed at night, looking up at the stars, wondering where your next meal is going to come from, wondering what this baby in your womb is going to grow up to become. Hagar, hey, tell me about all of your doubts. Tell me about all of your pain. Tell me about your childhood and what you thought your life was going to be like growing up and what it's like now. God says, Hagar, hey, will you name And I believe that God asks Hagar this question. It's a poignant question because he wants to lead us forward. Remember, without any processing, there is no progressing. And here's what we start to see is to go where God is calling, you need to first acknowledge where you've been. 
And so he takes Hagar on this, on this journey. He doesn't want her to look past her pain. He wants her to name it and stare it square in the face. So let me ask you, where have you been? Where have you been? The, the, the good and the bad. Where have you been? To, to all the moms out there, let me uniquely ask you this question this morning. Where have you been? The joys, the, the sorrows, the pain, the excitement, the exhaustion. Where have you been? God cares. But there's also the second part of the question. Did you catch the second part of the question? Where are you what? Where are you going? So Hagar, it's not just about where you've been. Actually, it's about where you're going. And if you read Hagar's answer, what she says is, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. She, she sort of answers both questions all in one. But her answer, where are you going, is not an answer. It's what are you running from? That's what she answers. But she doesn't have an answer for where are you going? She, she doesn't have an answer for what her future looks like. She doesn't have an answer for what her hope is. She doesn't have an answer for her dreams for the future. Those have all been dashed. They're done. She has no answer for where she's going, only what she is running from. Uh, you can imagine her saying, where, where am I going? I'm a single pregnant woman in a foreign land who doesn't have a penny to my name. And you, God, have the audacity to ask me where I'm going. <sighs> Give me a break. But here's what you need to see. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. God wants Hagar to process so, she, so that she can Pro make progress, and none of what she is facing is too big for God to overcome. That, that's a word for somebody who's in here today, because the rest of this passage is about the way that God breathes hope and life into a situation that looks nothing like what the dreams of the person had. It's God bringing peace into the pain and future into the desperation. And I want to show you the way that that happens. There's a few things that stood out to me as I was reading through the rest of this passage this week, thinking about all the moms in this space, but also all the people who would say, I want to, I want to learn to live in the way of Jesus with the heart of Jesus. There's a few things that stand out to me. I want to show them to you about what it looks like to make progress. First, the angel of the Lord said to her, everybody say it with me, return to your mistress and what? Submit to her. That's a hard command, is it not? And she's on the run because she's been kicked out. For her to go back seems like taking a massive step backwards. And what I would say to you is this is a unique command given by God. I don't think that all of us need to apply this command directly. You might be in a situation today that you left and you read this and you go, return and submit? God, is that what you're saying to me also? And I would say, not necessarily, but the principle that's behind this, the, the calling from God and the invitation from God is that we would be people who embrace confidence as we submit to God's plan. Because what God is saying to Hagar in the midst of her wilderness, he's got a plan for her. And what we learn from the specific command given to Hagar is that God's plan is often more difficult than we can imagine. Yes? <laughs> it often runs contrary to our natural desires. Yes? And it means that we have to relinquish control. As I read through this story, there's just this swirl of chaos that's going on. I mean, every single person in the story is disappointed. Did you catch that? Sarai is disappointed because she can't have kids. Hagar's disappointed because she got pregnant and got kicked out. Abraham's disappointed because he's caught in between two sister wives now. Ain't no way the brother's going to survive that well. 
right? Everybody in the story is disappointed on some level. And yet, and yet, if we zoom out, what we see is that God is at work in the midst of it all. Not causing all of it, but working in the midst of all of it. In the midst of the chaos. In the midst of the fractured dreams, he's at work. And in the midst of your chaos, in the midst of your fractured dreams, he's at work. Uh, There's two implications that this truth sort of drew to the surface for me. I think they uniquely apply to moms, but like I said at the beginning, they apply to all of us. Here's the first one. Here's the first one. If God has a plan, I don't need to control. If God has a plan, I don't need to control. But I think that requires that we admit that one of the hardest parts about submitting to God's plan is surrendering ours. One of the hardest parts about submitting to God's plan is surrendering ours. And yet it's where this beautiful journey of discipleship really begins. You don't need to know the whole plan. You just need to do the next right thing. You just need to be obedient to what Jesus would say to you in that moment to take that next right step. I'm I'm reminded that raising kids is a lot more like tending to a garden than it is like running a factory. And we water, and we fertilize, and then they fertilize us, right? Um, And we tend to it, but we don't control it. A factory, you plug in the right inputs, and you get an output. (laughs) Parenting just doesn't work that way. I think it's a word for us. God has a plan. I don't need to control. Here's the way that the scriptures would say it in the book of Proverbs. The heart of a of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Here's the Mother's Day version of the same verse. The heart of a mom plans their kid's life, but God establishes their steps. That's Proverbs 16, verse 9, Ryan's paraphrase. <laughs> Specifically for Mother's Day. <laughs> right? But we can relate, can't we? Because... We want to control because we want good to come. But the journey that Sarai's on is of letting go and of trusting God. I love the way that author and a member of EFCC, Cindy Denise, put it in her book, God Confident Kids. She said, I am not my child's Holy Spirit. As parents, it can be hard to relinquish control. We want to have the final say. But we do our children a big disservice by not teaching them to develop their own God confidence. Teaching them to say, God has a plan for me. And I'm going to do my best to follow after it. Here's a second implication. The first is if God has a plan, I don't need to control. The second, if God has a plan, I don't need to be what? Perfect. I don't know if I'm preaching to anybody else in here, but I know I'm preaching to me. If God's at work behind the scenes in the midst of the chaos, as a parent, we don't need to beat ourselves up for all the things that we did wrong and all the ways that we messed up. We're called to do our best undoubtedly in every situation in life. But if God is at work behind the scenes in the midst of the chaos and the midst of the mess, I can repent of my imperfections and my wrongs and the way that I've blown it and still trust that God is at work. This should give us great confidence, friends. Great confidence, That he will work his plan for good in the lives of not only ourselves, but of our kids and of our grandkids, even if we don't stick the dismount every time. Because this just in, you won't. You won't. And I think Hagar's story is teaching us God is at at work even in the midst of the chaos. Listen to where the story goes next. It says, the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they can be numbered for multitude. Verse 11. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. (laughs) 
I'm glad you thought that was funny because I did too when I read through it (laughs) again this week. And everyone's hand against him and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. Here's what I want you to see. God comes alongside a single woman, mom-to-be, in distress. Her whole life has been torn apart, and he makes her a promise. Bigger than she could imagine. Bigger than she could have even think to ask for. And he comes alongside of her. And he says, I'm going to make you a promise so that when life gets dark and when things get bleak, you will have an anchor for your soul to come back to. And there's an invitation for us in this as well to receive strength as you trust God's promises for your life as well. The promise is designed to hold Hagar. In her uncertainty, when it felt like life was falling apart. You need to hear this, Emmanuel Faith. One of the ways God leads you forward is by giving you a promise to hold on to. A promise to hold on to. And there's a lot of promises in the scriptures. I'm sure as you've read through, you you sort of see some that resonate with you. And and I went around to a number of different uh, moms on our staff this week just to ask What are some of the promises you've prayed over your kids that have given you great hope? None of them said, I'm claiming that my son will be a wild donkey of a man. (laughs) In case you were wondering. None of them said that. Uh, Lori Pierce told me that she prays over her kids. God, raise these kids in spite of me. It's a great prayer. Deb Hill my assistant said that she prays Jeremiah 29, 11 over her kids and had since they were little. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, plan to give you a hope and a future. That's a great promise. It's a great promise. Lynette Fuson, our director of care and counseling, said that she prays Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 over her kids. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. I don't know who's walking through a season today where you're going, God, it seems like you started something that's on pause or has been stopped altogether. This is a great promise for you to pray over yourself, over your kids, over family, over friends. He who began a good work in you, it doesn't say he might carry it on to completion. It says that he will. It's a promise. And it's a promise from God that you can take to the bank. I asked Bonnie Nichols, our director of women's ministry, what passages she prays over her kids. And she said one of them that she prays is, and my God will supply how many? How many? Every need of yours, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And I think about all that we are facing in our world, in our nation and globally. What a great promise. And certainly, for all the moms that are here today, one of the ways that God supplies the needs that your kids have is through you. But it's not the only way. And he is at work in the midst of all things, even the frustrations. And when you realize you don't have everything that your child needs, what you can also remember is that God does. Is that God does. And he promises to supply their needs. So Hagar is in the middle of the wilderness next to a spring. She receives living water for her soul in the form of of direction, a plan. And in the form of, of a promise to hold her. And then she responds with an affirmation about who God is. Verse 13. It says, and so she called the name Of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. For she said, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Bir Lahai Roy means well of 
the living one who sees me. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's meaningful and beautiful, isn't it? The, the spring of life that flows from the God who sees me. Here's what I want you to see. That Hagar, this Egyptian slave, is the only person who names God in the scriptures. Do you catch that? that, that every other time, it's, it's God telling us what his name is. He, he introduces himself to the children of Israel as, as Elohim, the, the creator, most high God, as Yahweh, the, the covenant-keeping God, as El Shaddai, the, the almighty, nobody's bigger, nobody's more powerful God. But Hagar looks back at God and gives God a name. And it's recorded in scripture, so evidently God agrees with it. <laughs> right? You are El Roy. You are the God who sees me. So, so if you got to give God a name, what name would you give him? What, what name would you give him? I think the name that we would give back to God is a reflection of the way that he meets the deepest need in our soul. You are my comforter. You are the forgiver. You are merciful and greatness, great, merciful and gracious, slow to anger abounding in steadfast love. You are, somebody yell one out. You are what? Love it. Love it. Yeah. It's a reflection of what our soul longs for most. So what did Hagar need? She needed to know that she was what? Seen. That she was seen. And not just seen like God knows where I'm located geographically on the map. But she needed to know she was seen. What was going on in her soul, the turmoil, the questions, the doubts, the desperation, that somehow the creator God of the universe saw it all. And I don't know if you are here today and you feel invisible, but I can assure you that you are not invisible to the creator God of the universe. He is not just El Shaddai, and he is not just um, Yahweh. He is also Elroy. He is still the God who sees. And I love the way that Jeremiah recorded the words of God when he said, my eyes will watch over them for their what? For their good. For their good. There's an invitation for us today as Jesus followers to find comfort in the fact that God sees you. He is not too busy holding the world together that he misses what's going on in your heart. I've been told that um, many, specifically many moms, wonder if they're invisible. Because of, there comes a time when it feels like your life is enveloped <laughs> by these people that we call children. Your identity starts to become found in him. There's a, an article written by a woman named Nicole Johnson. It's entitled, Am I Invisible? Listen to just a portion of it. She wrote this. It began to all make sense. The blank stares, the lack of response, the way one of the kids would walk into the room while I'm on the phone and ask to be taken to the store. Inside, I'm thinking, can you see me? I'm on the phone, and obviously not. And no one can see me, see that I'm on the phone, or cooking, or sweeping the floor, or even standing on my head in the corner, because no one can see me. I'm invisible. She writes, some days I'm only a pair of hands, nothing more. Can you fix this? Can you tie this? Can you open this? Some days I'm not a pair of hands, I'm... A not even a human being. I'm a clock. What time is it? I'm a satellite to guide and to answer. What number is the Disney Channel? I'm a car to order. Right around 5.30, please. I was certain that these were hands that at one time held books. 
eyes that studied history, and a mind that graduated. But now they have all disappeared into the peanut butter, (laughs) never to be seen again. She's going, she's going, she's gone. And if you would add an amen to that, I want you to know God sees you. He sees you when you serve. He sees you when you hurt. He sees you when you rejoice. He sees what you hold in secret. He sees when you feel invisible. He sees. He sees. And isn't that what what moms do at their best? They also see. Um, not all of us in the room are moms, and not even all of us in the room um, have their mom uh, alive anymore, but all of us had a mom at one point in time. And my guess is that you can remember doing something to try to get your mom to see. Mom, watch me do this. Mom, I've got a story to tell. Mom, I, I, I heard this joke at school. I mean, sometimes it seems like our dinner table is just constantly that. Look at me, look at me, look at me, right? And my guess is that some of your fondest memories of your mom are moments where she just paused to see. It's one of the things that I love about my mom. I was what you would call a, a strong-willed child. I know that shocks a lot of you. <laughs> my mom did a lot of reading of Uh, Dr. James Dobson to figure out what to do with me. Um, uh, This is a a picture that I think in so many ways summarizes my relationship with my mom. It's it's her 40th birthday and um, there I am, right? And in so many ways, it's a reflection of uh, 18 years (laughs) of relationship and love and affection. And this woman saw that goof in all of his antics, in all of his pain, in all of his frustration, and she cared. See, we become like Jesus when we pause to see too. And there are so many moms and grandmas and aunts and surrogate moms in this space who do the exact same thing. And if God is El Roy, the God who sees, then we become like him as we choose to see also. It's one of the things I love most about my wife. It's one of the things I loved most about my mom. And it's one of the things I want to encourage you, keep going. I think to all the moms out there who are wondering, am I getting it all right? No. (laughs) Free yourself from that. Free yourself from that. I don't think it's even the right question. Maybe the right question is, do you see? Do you see the gifts that are right in front of you? And my guess is you do. Keep going. Keep going. Remarkably, Psalm 32, verse 8 will say this. I will instruct you, this is God speaking, and teach you in the way that you shall go. I will guide you with my eye, which is really interesting imagery because if God guides us with his eye, it means that we have to be doing what? Looking back at him. If he's guiding us with his eye, it means that we are looking back at him. And how... How much of a game changer is it to go into every single day knowing not only that God is the God who sees me, but I have this beautiful invitation in my life to lift my eyes to see him who is looking at me face to face, eye to eye, in the midst of all of the challenges, in the midst of all the frustrations, in the midst of all of the questions, we get to look back at the God who is looking at us. And here's the question. What does he see when he looks at you? See, see friends, my, my internal narrative starts to rehearse all the things that I've messed up. Is anybody with me? Man, that's not what I see when I look at my kids. What I see when I look at my kids is 
absolute, unconditional love. Are they perfect? No. <laughs> but man, I love them. And man, I'm for them. And oh, do I want good for them. So Elroy looks at you and says, hey, would you look up at me? And when you look back at him, what you don't see is judgment and condemnation and anger and him shaking his head going, what you see is the love of a parent who says, you are mine. And on the mountaintops, I'm for you. And in the valleys, I'm for you. And everywhere in between, I'm with you and I see you today. Would you choose to see the God who sees you? He looks at you with a plan that brings confidence, with a promise that brings strength, and with love that brings comfort. So here's the thing, you guys. Don't be afraid to look back at God and say, look Watch! Have you heard this joke? Have you seen this one? He's the God who sees, and just like every parent, every mom, every aunt, every uncle, we look back and we go, show me, show me. The God of the universe does the exact same thing to you. Look at the God who's looking at you and receive his love in a new way. To all the moms out there, Happy Mother's Day. You live this out so well. Keep going. Keep loving Jesus. Keep loving your family well. For all of the aunts, for all of the surrogate moms, for all of the people who wish they could be moms and aren't, for this day stirs up pain and sorrow. We are with you and we see you and we want to be a community of people who celebrate with those who celebrate and mourn with those who mourn. But maybe even more than all of that, we want to be a people who say we want to live in the way of Jesus with the heart of Jesus. So Lord, help us all. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So Father, thank you for seeing. For being a God that we can call back confidently Elroy. We want to look back to you today. As you look at us, and we want to receive all the love that you want to pour into our hearts, may it change the way we live. Thank you for seeing us, for your plan, for your promise, for your love. We're thankful in Jesus' name. Amen.